lot for having me here. Thanks a lot for being here. This is a great conference. Uh, the organization is spotless, uh, uh, really. It's really, it's really good and, uh, to see also so many, many people. Um, the talk I've got for today is called Green Ops in the Cloud. Uh, I'm just going to introduce myself uh, first. My name is Sandro. Uh, I work as a senior consultant at the Scale Factory. The Scale Factory is a cloud infrastructure uh, consultancy based in the, in the UK, even though if you've got people scattered uh, across different places in, uh, in Europe. Uh, and uh, our main line of work is consultancy, and we particularly focus on helping uh, SaaS businesses uh, to, to grow and scale. Um, we work mainly with uh, Amazon Web Services, and this is why the examples in my uh, talk are mainly coming from uh, um, that background. But I will try to also uh, mention the um, equivalent services in uh, Google Cloud uh, and uh, in Azure, and also try to explain them also in plain terms if you're not familiar with uh, uh, all the services or the AWS jargon, because I'm also puzzled sometimes how they name their, their services. Um, these are the topics that I'm going to cover today. I'm going to start with uh, discussing, uh, introducing uh, carbon emissions in the uh, IT sector, just to give you an overview, and then define the concept of green ops. Uh, the bulk of my talk is uh, giving you practical tips and strategies uh, to mitigate and reduce uh, the carbon footprint uh, in the cloud. Uh, then I'm going to move into um, holding cloud vendors accountable for carbon emissions, and then I'm going to wrap up with um, conclusions. First of all, uh, carbon emission in the ICT sector. I want to start with these two uh, statements, uh, which are actually quite uh, um, uh, worrying. So I'm going to read them out. The first one is from uh, Alliance Research. Uh, um, even without taking into account the cryptocurrency boom, the global ICT sector emits as much greenhouse gases as the aviation sector. The second one comes from another source, the International uh, um, Energy Agency. Data centers and data transmission networks are responsible for 1% of uh, energy-related uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and each of these uh, data center and uh, data transmission, each of these accounts for between 1% and 1.5% um, of global uh, electricity use. Uh, so these are pretty staggering and worrying um, uh, um, um, statements. Uh, uh, and I try to give you sources for everything I'm saying. And uh, I'll give you sources at the, uh, at the end in the final slide. I try to base this on facts, uh, and sometimes it's not easy. And uh, this is why, as every consultant will tell you, it depends. So the first thing, it depends how you calculate these carbon uh, emissions. And this is where it gets really, really tricky. Um, so some calculations I discovered for this talk, uh, I had to do a little bit of research myself, as I'm not uh, a trained uh, uh, environmental engineer, that there are three type, there are usually three types um, of uh, emissions uh, uh, that are used when calculating greenhouse um, gases emissions. These are called scope one, scope two, and scope three. The scope one are those that are directly emitted by your line of business. The second one is the one that are indirectly uh, emitted. To give you an example is the electricity that a data center might use. Uh, so they need that energy in order to power the data center. The third one, which is the most controversial, is the uh, emissions that are emitted by manufacturing devices and disposing these devices. And you can see how this is quite different in the ICT sectors when you start looking at all the devices. Uh, uh, if you take into account uh, skip, uh, scope three emissions, it's going to be quite a different uh, calculation. So this is why sometimes getting the data for this, uh, even uh, from the cloud provider, is tricky. It's tricky because uh, they don't all count the same things in the same way. Uh, there is another thing in the aviation industry. Typically, they emit uh, uh, greenhouse gases at higher altitude, which is much more impacting the environment uh, than the lower um, altitude. So this is why it's a bit difficult to, um, to, to calculate this. Some analysts suggest that uh, IC the ICT sector emits uh, uh, the same or even more uh, um, greenhouse gases than the aviation industry, other don'ts. Notice that those 
who don't are also from the uh, from the tech sector. So I'm going to cover this part towards the uh, the um, the end. But it was an interesting thing that I I wanted to show you two sides of this uh, this research. Um, but what is without doubt is that the ICT sector plays a role in greenhouse gases emissions, and this uh, um, uh, emissions uh, keeps growing. This is a graph from the uh, International Telecommunication Union, taking data from 2020 to 2021. And it shows you the trajectory of the uh, global greenhouse gases emission in the ICT sector for the scenario of uh, uh, increase of temperature of 1.5 uh, um, degree. Um, I found this graph uh, uh, worrying and uh, um, giving hope at the same time. If you see the dotted line with the uh, red uh, dots, this is basically, if we continue business as usual, as we've done so far, uh, this is the trajectory of the greenhouse gases emission in the ICT sector. However, if we start implementing um, uh, measures to reduce the carbon emission in the ICT sectors, we can actually um, uh, drive this uh, curve down and reach even uh, the uh, net um, zero carbon emissions by 2050 or even earlier, if possible. And this is where the ICT sector uh, is the problem and the solution at the same time, because the ICT sector can empower other industries to become greener, to reduce their carbon emissions. So it is this, the problem and the solution at the same time. And I think here, as tech leaders, uh, we do have a responsibility for the way we architect things um, in our sector. So this is why I urge you to take into account also the way we, um, we build things and um, look at the environmental impact that we are, we are having by designing all the great things that we built. Um, here I introduce a, a catchword. This is really, you know, like many things ending in ops is, a, is really a catchword. Um, green ops uh, is an operating model uh, uh, aimed at optimizing the efficient, efficiency of the cloud while at the same time uh, minimizing its environmental uh, um, impact. And what it does is really providing methodology, strategies, practical tips for reducing or mitigating the carbon emissions of the things that we, that we built. So here I'm going to talk about practical tips. So if you use the cloud, some of this should resonate with you. You should be familiar with this. If you don't use the cloud or you're planning to use the cloud, these are some of the things that I urge you to consider and take into account. So Tip number one, use cloud regions running on renewable energies. Um, cloud uh, providers, they all have a concept of regions, which is basically a bunch of data servers in a specific uh, location. Uh, this is um, uh, yeah, a picture from uh, AWS regions. Uh, uh, I think at the moment there are about 33 regions, uh, different regions, if you count all the different locations. However, not all these regions are built equal in terms of uh, uh, their carbon emissions. Um, this heat map is from an organization called uh, uh, Climatic, and uh, it basically scores uh, the uh, CO2 emissions output per CPU hour of these uh, data centers. So you can see the red ones are the ones that uh, um, emit more carbon emissions. The blue ones are the ones that are producing fewer carbon uh, emissions. And you can score the different cloud providers. Uh, here I'm just showing you uh, AWS. But you can, uh, you can also compare the different cloud providers or see within a cloud provider which regions are, uh, um, are using more renewable energy. Which, because at the end of the day, it is, it is that the data center is still consuming the same energy. But where this energy comes from? Um, of course, when you choose a region in your cloud provider, um, you have to consider several things. Um, but I would like you to take into account also this parameter of the sustainability, the environmental impact. Of course, you have to consider the latency, how close the region is to your end user. 
You might have compliance uh, uh, reasons. For example, your data needs to be in a specific uh, location, even in a specific country. You might you, um, choose a region because of the, um, the wealth of services and features that you need. Uh, you might choose a region because of the cost. Some regions are cheaper than, uh, than others. But I'd like you to add another parameter in your choice, and it is the environmental impact. Look at the region and see how it scores uh, uh, against this, uh, um, um, this, uh, this map that I showed you um, uh, before. And take this into account when you choose uh, a region. Tip number two, design serverless and event-driven architecture. If you're not familiar with the concept, a serverless architecture is a way to build applications without having to manage uh, um, the infrastructure underneath. Uh, um, in practice, there are still servers running. It's not that there are no servers. Someone has to run this service. However, the cloud provider manages directly this, uh, this service, and they will manage the, the service in a much more efficient way than you can ever do. Uh, even if you've got lots of experience, they have economies of scales. They run this stuff at scale. Um, so you, not only you have to uh, you, you reduce the burden, but you also, uh, for the same application uh, workload, uh, the impact that the application workload has uh, on the, uh, the environment is, is reduced because you are optimizing, basically, um, the, um, the, uh, the, the running. Uh, the typical example um, case study, um, I'm going to show you one here, is of an event-driven architecture, um, is you upload a, a photo on a service disk, lands in a data storage in AWS, it's called the S3. This triggers an event which is taken uh, uh, by um, uh, a function. This is the service called uh, Lambda, it's called functions in uh, GCP and uh, Azure. This does something, in this case it will be, it will uh, um, create the thumbnail and the different, all the different formats of this uh, um, image and then uh, provides it then to the, to the user. In a serverless architecture, you basically you run a server only for the time that it takes you to run that uh, Lambda function. It could be a few seconds, uh, a minute, that's it. If you deploy uh, this in a, a traditional server um, architecture, you basically have the server typically running 24-7 and being idle most of the time. So it's, it's a waste of energy, um, uh, basically, and a waste of money, by the way. Um, lots of these tips uh, are actually, um, they go hand in hand with cost optimization, with security, with uh, resilience. Uh, so they're good for the environment, but they're good for your pocket and they're good for your application as well. Tip number three, right size, maximize utilization and stop unused resources. I put in here several things, but they all fall into the same category. Um, right sizing is just choose the right uh, uh, server type, for example, the right amount of CPU and memory um, for your uh, workload or for your database, uh, for example. Um, if you use, um, in AWS, there is a service called uh, Trusted Advisor, which will tell you if your instance uh, is, uh, um, is actually right-sized. It will basically look at the utilization, and uh, typically for a server, if a server is utilized less than 20% of the CPU most of the time, you're basically um, wasting energy. Um, ideally, uh, if you look at the service and to some extent also a database is a bit more complicated for the database because there are different metrics you have to take into account. But for a server, you typically look at CPU and memory. The CPU, a good utilization depending on the workload is typically around between 40 and 60 percent. Uh, if you run anything below 20 percent, you are um, you're wasting, uh, wasting energy basically and money. Uh, as well. Um, there is another concept that uh, you introduce uh, that is often used for the resilience of an application is auto-scaling. This is where you've got an application, you've got a peak, uh, let's say a Black Friday uh, type of traffic, uh, you increase the number of servers or the number of containers that you run in your application when you, reach, when you start reaching that peak and then you're shrinking, so you scale in the resources when uh, the peak is gone and you are a normal load. Uh, this is a, um, a strategy uh, for resilience, but it's also optimizing uh, the energy that you are, that you are using. Um, and, again, and then the last one is something that, as a consultant, I see all the time, and I'm, uh, I'm, I say, why? <laughs> uh, 
uh, stop that server that you don't use, delete that EBS volume uh, that you forgot to delete, do the uh, Marie Kondo uh, thing and declutter your stuff. Uh, uh, I've seen um, teams running their very expensive testing servers over the weekend or overnight. Nobody's using these things. Uh, shut them down, and if you use infrastructure as code, uh, it should be as simple as uh, running a command or clicking a button, provision the infrastructure that you need, and then delete it at the end. You will save enormous amount of mine, and you will, you will, uh, you will help this uh, um, uh, reducing the, the carbon emissions. Uh, this is a quote I love from the uh, DP of AWS Global Infrastructure, uh, Peter DeSantis. The greenest energy is the energy that we don't use. Tip number four, switch to power efficient uh, G uh, CPU and GPU processors. Uh, um, so there are some uh, more recent uh, processors. Uh, typically, they are ARM-based. Uh, in AWS, these are called Graviton2 or Graviton3. I think in Google Cloud, they are called the T23. In Azure, they are ARM-based um, processors, and they're usually much more uh, power efficient. Uh, they usually have uh, two, from 2 up to 3.5 uh, a better CPU. They are also cheaper. Uh, however, the caveat here is check that your workload can, is actually suitable uh, for uh, running on ARM base. It's not always the, uh, the case. You might not have the package for an ARM uh, uh, processor, so double check that. I want to introduce that caveat. Tip number five, use reserved and spot uh, instances. Uh, reserved instances is a concept in AWS uh, that is actually a billing discount for uh, running instances by committing to a specific level of usage. I think in Azure, they're also called the reserved instances. In Google Cloud, I think it's called committed use, but it's a similar concept. You basically say, okay, I'm gonna commit to use this server or this a fleet of servers for a period in AWS is typically uh, from one, uh, one year or three years, and you commit that. How is this helping the environment? Actually, it helps the cloud provider to provision and uh, do their capacity planning so that you know you're going to commit with, uh, with that. They can actually buy those servers, uh, provision those servers. They know you're going to be using them. For them, it's much easier. Um, to, uh, um, yeah, to manage the, the, the fleet of service across many, many customers. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum, we have spot instances. So spot instances are just spare compute capacity that is available at a specific time. They usually come with uh, a significant discount. Sometimes it's 90% uh, um, um, discount. Uh, it's basically the equivalent, if you want an analogy, is to uh, run your washing machine uh, overnight or during the weekend if you have an energy contract uh, that has a different price for uh, day rate or uh, nitrate. It's a bit the equivalent. You use the energy when it's less used, uh, and you're not contributing to uh, the energy picks when it's most, most used. Again, the caveat here is uh, um, not all the workloads are uh, um, suitable uh, for uh, um, spot instance. You need to be able to stop what uh, you're doing without any, any, any problem for your workload. You can also use a mix of uh, on-demand and spot, which is a very popular strategy, for example, for uh, auto-scaling. Tip number six, uh, store your data efficiently. Um, so here, it probably rings a bell with the presentation that Chris Cooney did before. Uh, so I had a sort of deja vu when I saw his, his slides. Uh, um, here, I'm talking about how to store uh, um, the data efficiently. In uh, AWS, uh, the uh, block storage is called the S3. I think it's called the block storage in Azure and uh, Google uh, storage uh, in uh, GCP. And they have uh, 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 different varieties of um, S3 um, uh, function, uh, S3 um, um, products, basically. You think S3 is one thing, but actually they have uh, the standard uh, uh, S3 where your data is replicated in three availability zones in three different data centers. And then they've got uh, other types of uh, storages, maybe just one data center or even uh, the, the S3 Glacier service where it's a sort of a deep uh, storage where the data is not immediately um, reachable. You need to have um, sometimes a few hours before you, uh, you can retrieve the data, and it's typically used for, um, uh, for um, archiving um, uh, data. 
There are a few services in AWS that can help you to do this automatically. There is a service called S3 um, um, Lifecycle Rules. Uh, you basically define some rules. Let's say your data should be in S3 standard for the first 30 days. After 30 days, you know that that data is not going to be used that much. You can actually move it automatically with these lifecycle rules to a cheaper storage, and the storage that is better for the environment because it's only uh, replicated in a single uh, um, availability zone. And uh, if you need to, then to transition the data, maybe after um, you know two months, three months, but you have to keep it for five years, 10 years because of compliance or auditing reasons, you can move it automatically to um, Glacier, for example. Uh, you introduce automation here for doing these things. You don't have to every three months, two weeks, uh, move this data yourself. Uh, uh, S3 does this all behind the scenes if you use uh, um, um, this, um, uh, um, this service, the uh, lifecycle rules. If you don't know your pattern of data, and this is sometimes the case when you introduce a new service, a new feature, you can use a service called S3 Intelligent Tiering, where AWS will analyze the, automatically uh, your patterns of uh, access in the data, and then will move your data accordingly. Um, to uh, rules that you, that you define. So this is really useful when you don't know, is this data really going to be used? I'm not sure. You can use this service. It will automatically do this, uh, this for you, always based on rules that you set. Um, tip number seven, use a content delivery network, a CDN. If you're not familiar with the concept of a CDN, is just a distributed group of uh, servers, and it's used for uh, caching content near the end user. You typically cache things like images, HTML pages, static pages, CSS, uh, even parts of uh, JavaScript. Uh, you can put them uh, in. Uh, you can use caching for uh, for this, and the CDN will cache uh, the the content closer to the user. How does this help the environment? Actually, when you do a request, uh, the, the packet that you get back has to travel much less. And so you use, again, less energy, uh, less network systems, and uh, uh, also your, your application is usually more efficient and also quicker to deliver uh, to, the, to the customer. Again, if you use AWS, there is a check in Trusted Advisor, which is uh, this tool for helping you um, optimizing things, including the, uh, um, your carbon footprint, uh, that recommends if your S3 buckets uh, uh, could, use, uh, could benefit from a CDN or not. Here I'm going to give you an example of how this works uh, in, uh, in reality. So let's say your S3 bucket, your data is in South Africa. So if you're not using a CDN, when a user requests uh, um, uh, the data, it will uh, basically request it from the location where um, it's, um, it's basically uh, based. And then uh, the packet will, uh, the request will go down to South Africa, and then the response will, uh, will go back. If you cache uh, um, the, um, the content of the bucket into a closer um, uh, a region to the user, and you typically use uh, um, services like CloudFront, which is the CDN in AWS, or edge locations, uh, the packet has to travel a much uh, shorter distance, as you can see on, uh, on, the, on the second part of uh, the, uh, the graph on your uh, right-hand side. Uh, um, so again, better efficiency, but better for uh, um, uh, carbon, uh, reducing carbon emissions. Tip number eight, uh, use managed services. Uh, a managed service is a service that is operated and maintained directly by the cloud uh, um, provider. As I said before, the cloud provider will manage them much more efficiently than you can ever, you can ever do, because they have these economies of scales. They run uh, data uh, centers at, um, at scale. Um, you will typically use managed services uh, you know, for databases, uh, for a Kubernetes cluster, um, instead of uh, running your own server and then uh, spin up your Postgres database or even was your fleet of uh, uh, um, Kubernetes clusters running on EC2 instances. I did this in the early days. I don't recommend it to anyone. Use the managed service. It will simplify um, you know, control plane activities, uh, um, node scheduling, uh, maintenance, upgrading with Kubernetes, which you have to upgrade every three, three six months. Uh, it will do 
it will uh, basically reduce the operational costs and you can use those skills, uh, um, you know, you can use your database administrators for uh, um, optimizing uh, SQL queries uh, for analyzing slow queries instead of, uh, um, you know, doing backups. Uh, you can use the automation from the managed, uh, managed services. Uh, and again, this is helping the environment by um, basically reduce, um, running these things at, uh, in, in a much more efficient way and reducing the, the energy that you use. You pay a little bit more for these services. This is what often people complain but often people don't take into account the operational costs. And as someone said before, engineering cost is the most, uh, um, uh, most important cost. Tip number nine, perform a well-architected review. Um, in AWS, there is a way that you can uh, actually review all uh, your workloads. And uh, there is a pillar that has been introduced in the past years uh, um, by AWS. It's the sustainability pillar. We'll, give you, we'll ask you a few questions about how you are managing your uh, workload based on uh, some of the parameters. And you will find some of the things that I mentioned uh, um, uh, here. Uh, here, I'm afraid I have to do a shameless plug to my company, uh, but it's a freebie at the same time. Uh, so we do provide a free uh, AWS well-architected review. You can simply book one. Uh, you can go on the website and book it now. Uh, one of my colleagues will, uh, will come back to you, um, and uh, there is absolutely no engagement then uh, to continue with us uh, um, if you want to implement or not implement things. So make use of this, uh, this, uh, this freebie. Um, uh, it will make my employer also happy. Uh, last tip, tip number 10, carbon footprint uh, tools. Uh, these are some tools that will help you measure your carbon footprint in the cloud. In AWS, there is a tool called uh, yeah, carbon footprint tool. Um, that's what it's written on the tin. Uh, it will also allow you to give, it will also give you some historical data so that you can go back also to your stakeholder and you can show how you're doing on your journey or reducing carbon emission. Um, this tool has been a little bit criticized because uh, of two reasons. It doesn't take, at least when I checked it, it doesn't take into account uh, scope three emissions. And second, as you can see in the graph, uh, the emissions by geography, it doesn't, is not fine-grained. Uh, it, uh, uh, it gives you uh, the EMEA region, for example, which is a little bit useless. If you have a big company with, and you use several regions, uh, you want to pin uh, really to the region that you are uh, analyzing and see how maybe how different teams are, uh, are doing. So this is why I want to give you some third-party tools um, as well that might be also a bit more independent uh, in uh, uh, how carbon emissions are calculated. Uh, I'm mentioning the one from Climatix, which provides an API. Uh, Greenly is another company that provides um, um, cloud the GA, um, greenhouse gases assessments. It's more in a form of a report. Uh, and uh, if you want to build your own, you can use Cloud Carbon Footprint, which is an open source tool. And I believe the Climatic uh, I API uh, uses uh, um, this open source tool behind the scenes. Uh, now I've got just uh, two minutes, I think. I want to um, uh, move to a bit of a more political part of the, of the talk. Uh, this is where I put my consultant hat uh, off, uh, and then I put on my citizen hat. So here I'm giving you opinions, which are my opinions. So they're not necessarily best practices, but I'm giving you what I think. Um, so take it or uh, with a pinch of salt, uh, uh, but I want to share um, this, this with you. Um, first, I want to introduce the concept of greenwashing. Uh, I'm going to read it, this definition from uh, uh, Wikipedia. Greenwashing is a false, misleading, or untrue action made by an organization about the positive impact that a company, a product, or a service has to, on the environment. The typical uh, case study here is the Dieselgate scandal. Uh, you might remember from a few years ago, this dates from uh, probably 2010-ish. Uh, this was when uh, Volkswagen uh, Golf uh, TDI, uh, which are advertised as clean diesel, I don't know if there is such a thing, but uh, anyway, they were um, basically fudging the uh, carbon emissions coming from uh, their uh, TDI uh, engines. Uh, it was actually a software problem, and uh, they, um, they had to, uh, they basically um, did their carbon emissions, were the, the controls on the carbon emissions were triggered during tests, 
and, uh, but not during uh, real-time driving. And when this was calculated in real-time driving, it was 40 times more carbon emissions than during the lab uh, tests. This was actually a software um, um, uh, issue. Uh, problem that they, they um, fudged uh, themselves. So this is an example of greenwashing. Here are a few of the things that I think we can do as a consumer to hold uh, cloud vendors accountable. And by the way, you can replace cloud vendors with politicians um, as well. <laughs> um, so be aware of greenwashing. I gave you just an example. Ask for more transparent data and scrutiny of data. This is a problem with AWS. AWS is very secretive about their data center, the data. They don't provide this, um, this, uh, this data to everybody. And so ask for them. I think as a consumers, we've got uh, a power to ask for this. The company will follow because they follow the money. They don't care about the environment. Uh, but if more people uh, start to make their voice heard, uh, they, uh, they will basically um, start listening. Um, just going to give you the last one is uh, you can find this on, on Greenpeace, how the different uh, uh, cloud providers are uh, um, scoring. Uh, this is data from 2020, might have changed, but it gives you some idea of how the major cloud providers are uh, um, uh, doing. Um, yeah, just three things I want you to remember. Um, be aware of carbon footprint on the ICT sector. Use of some of the practical tips I gave you and make cloud uh, vendors and politicians accountable. Uh, these are sources that I used. Uh, and uh, um, uh, yeah, feel free to just chat to me or uh, get, in, uh, get in touch. Thanks. Sorry for. Uh,